Welcome to Science on Tap uh, in our new location at Chapman Crafted. Big round of applause for Chapman Crafted, please. <laughs> Beautiful space, really conducive to learning science. We should teach all Chapman classes here. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, also, a big round of applause for Panther Productions, who have come to uh, record and document all of the proceedings. Thank you for coming. Less enthusiasm for the video and sound than for the beer. Okay, so if you haven't been to uh, Science on Tap before, let me explain to you a little bit what this is. Uh, in Schmidt College of Science and Technology at Chapman, we want to try to bring some science out into the community and um, have people learn a little bit about what excites us, what gets us up in the morning out of bed. Um, this evening, we're going to learn a little bit about quantum physics. Uh, before we get to that, let me tell you how these things work. Professor Leifer and I will spend about 20 minutes talking about something that is absolutely enthralling and amazing, okay? And then we will instill in all of you such excitement that you will want to ask questions. You will also be thirsty at that point. So we will break after about 20 minutes and let you all get another beer and let you write questions on those note cards that are on the tables in front of you. After that 10 minute intermission, we will collect the cards and we will ask all of those questions. The important thing to note is, if your question is awesome enough to get asked, that gets you a free beer, okay? Yes, the gauntlet has been thrown down. So, think carefully, write wisely, and make sure that you've really considered quite deeply the meaning of your quantum existence before you ask a question, right? So, this evening we're going to be talking about quantum physics, and yet you're still all here, that's remarkable. Um, professor Leifer is a pr uh, professor of physics at Chapman. He knows just a smidge about quantum physics, and in particular, he's interested in something called entanglement. Matt, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and a little bit of an intro to entanglement? Sure. Um, so I'm Matt, and um, I'm interested in what's called the foundations of quantum mechanics, which means that I study all of the weird things about quantum mechanics. So anything that you've heard uh, in popular science articles about things possibly being in two places at once, or there being instantaneous uh, influences faster than light, or multiple universes, that's the kind of stuff I study. So the weird and, and crazy part of quantum mechanics. Um, so why am I doing this? Well, um, <clears throat> when I was a kid back in, back in the UK, I blame my grandparents for this because uh, I used to go to their apartment and in the foyer of their apartment, they had two mirrors which were opposite each other. Uh, and if you've ever seen that, you know that you see infinite reflections, which is a really uncommon architectural feature because it's quite distur a disturbing sight. So <clears throat> ever since then, I was fascinated by light. And so when in school I learned about uh, the physics of light, physics of r classical ray optics, that suddenly explained all of these things that I'd seen, like the infinite reflections in mirrors, I sort of felt a kind of eureka moment. It's kind of a feeling that's you know, almost better than sex or something. You know, it's like a very sort of visceral feeling. And at that moment, I understood that I needed to be a physicist. So uh, when I went to university in the UK, I went to the University of Manchester and then uh, the University of Bristol for my PhD. Um, I'd read a bunch of popular science books about things like relativity and quantum mechanics. So I'd learned this list of really weird and strange phenomena that happened. And I was waiting to have these uh, moments of eureka moments where I suddenly understood what these things are about. So I learned relativity and I had that moment and it was very exciting and I felt like I understood it. And then I uh, studied quantum theory and I was waiting, waiting to get this sudden burst of understanding and waiting and waiting. And to be honest, I'm still waiting. And uh, that's why I decided to study it because it feels like uh, although this is an extremely successful physical theory, 
there's still something that we don't understand. Every physicist, almost every physicist has a different idea about what quantum theory means, and we don't have a strong consensus. Um, so I've got used to being in a position of uncertainty, and we try to study these things, and we try to uh, get, get a better understanding, and we've learned a lot over the past few decades about what quantum mechanics isn't about. So we've learned a lot of ways in which the world cannot be like if quantum theory is true. A lot of things that you would think of like natural assumptions have been ruled out. And we do this through the use of thought experiments, thought experiments that have a habit of becoming real experiments that we later do in the lab. And one of the most famous ones in quantum theory concerns uh, quantum entanglement. What is quantum entanglement? It's very difficult to explain in a few words, but um, <coughs> the rough thing is it's a kind of correlation. It's the way that two physical systems can be related to each other, which uh, is just different from what we can have in classical physics, just different from what we have in everyday uh, experience. So. <clears throat> so, this, so you and I spent a little bit of time talking about entanglement and, and I, I came into those conversations with some preconceived notions and I left those conversations perhaps slightly more confused than I, I entered them. Um, but dig a little bit deeper and talk about why entanglement is even something that we care about and why physicists believe it's a worthwhile notion. Okay, so um, it's easier to explain what it is by explaining what it isn't, right? So suppose um, there are two boxes and inside each box is going to be a ball. Okay, the ball can either be blue or red. Okay, so suppose I uh, put those two balls, two balls in boxes and I make sure that I put either two blue balls or two red balls, right? You don't know which, but I'm going to make sure they're the same color. So then I'm going to send one of the boxes off to Mars and one of the boxes off to Venus. And uh, on Mars and Venus, are two people, we usually call them Alice and Bob. Alice opens her, her box and she finds, oh, it's a blue ball. Then immediately she knows that over on Mars, uh, Bob, when he opens his box, will also find a blue ball. And you would say, well, there's nothing very mysterious about that. Uh, if we had interstellar space travel, I could arrange uh, using uh, SpaceX, Amazon delivery or whatever to do that. I just order two of the same ball from Amazon and I have them sent off. Um, what a physicist would then say at this point is that, well, if these were quantum particles that are entangled, actually what quantum physics tells us is that there isn't a fact of the matter. There is, until, until somebody actually opens the package and looks at the ball, there's no fact about whether it's either blue or red. That happens when you look at it. Okay, the only thing that we can predict with certainty is that the colors are the same. So according to conventional quantum physics, there's no uh, information, nothing that exists in the world that tells us whether, which color the balls are. And yet, at the same time, when Alice opens her box and discovers either a red or blue ball, Bob over on Mars um, will also find the same. So if you believe that account, then you'd say, well, there's something very strange going on here because as soon as the measurement is made, as soon as the box is opened, suddenly there's instantaneous influence which goes over to Mars which tells uh, Bob's ball what color it should be. Now of course in physics we, all, we have an ultimate speed limit which was set by Einstein which is that no uh, influence should be able to travel faster than the speed of light. So we seem to have some kind of violation of that. But if you're smart in response to that you'll, you'll say well why should I believe you whatsoever that that's what's happening? Okay, why, why should I believe you that there is no fact of the matter before they're opened? A much simpler explanation is just that there were either two blue balls or either two red balls right from the beginning, right? So even though quantum mechanics makes no predictions like that, why shouldn't we just say that that's true? And to show that that's not true is a much, much harder task, but it was, we've basically known since the 1960s, since the work of John Bell, that uh, you cannot explain the kinds of correlations you get in quantum entanglement in this way. And a little bit later on in the break, 
uh, we're going to do a bit of a demonstration which will explain to you why that's the case. So I hope that you all are just as confused as I was after our last conversation. Um, I asked Professor Leifer a question at that point, and that was, um, and I'll ask him the same question again, because I think this really, the answer to this really, uh, I think summarizes very nicely what's special about this concept. And, and the question is, what one thing do you wish people knew about entanglement that they definitely don't know right now? Okay, so yeah, I'm going to tell you about something that you don't often hear about in the popular treatments of entanglement. Um, so one of the things that entanglements, one of the groups of people that entanglement's incredibly popular with is um, new age charlatans, okay? So people will use <laughs> entanglement to explain everything from psychokinesis, uh, telepathy, all kinds of things like this. And the reason is that um, whenever a quantum system, a particle, interacts with something else, and that's happening all the time, right? Photons are bouncing off me, the light in this room. There's lots of interactions going on. According to quantum mechanics, that generates huge amounts of entanglement. And even if we uh, look at our best theory of physics, uh, which is quantum field theory at the moment, that tells us that even empty space is, a, is, is in a vastly entangled state. So these correlations are really, really ubiquitous. Um, so the question is, if that's the case, why don't we just see it in our everyday lives? Why isn't it the case that uh, really entanglement could be used for telepathy or something like that? Um, and the answer to this question is something which has the name monogamy of entanglement. Uh, the name was invented by Charlie Bennett, who's one of the founders of quantum computing and has a, a great way with words. Um, but a better way of explaining it is that entanglement isn't like an ordinary classical correlation. What it's like is a secret, okay? So uh, if I whisper to Andrew right now a secret, so let me whisper you a secret. Okay. Ridiculous. Yeah. So uh, right now, Andrew and I share a secret. Nobody else in the room knows it. Okay. So uh, that's analogous to us sharing entanglement, right? But if Andrew goes and tells somebody else in the room, go and go and tell one other person. <clears throat> the ridiculous notion is that the DC universe is better than the Marvel universe. And that's okay. So, <laughs> so now, now by sharing the secret with everybody else in the room. Andrew and I no longer share a secret, okay? So, uh, however, everybody in the room still shares a secret from anybody outside here. So as a group, we share what you might call a multi-person multi secret, right? There's a large group of people who all share a secret, but no two of us share a secret because there are people outside that know. And the mathematics of entanglement works almost exactly like this, right? So. Uh, entanglement is in one sense ubiquitous in that any time uh, there's an interaction between physical systems it gets shared but at the same time it's incredibly fragile because if you share it with something else that's outside of you then nothing inside that group shares that anymore okay so uh, two people uh, wandering along trying to do a telekinesis tele uh, telepathy experiment whatever they are not entangled with each other the entire universe is extremely is an extremely entangled state, but if you pick any two systems in the universe, any two random particles in the universe, they will not be entangled at all uh, with pretty much certainty. Okay, so everybody in the room right now is asking the question, why have we wasted our time, <laughs> right? Because we've come to learn about some phenomenon that's so incredibly fragile that it doesn't matter. So we're going to pull you all back off the ledge now and figure out what about the world around us has anything to do with something that's, that's useful, right? What useful do we see in the world around us um, that has something to do with entanglement? Is there anything? Or is it just this kind of egghead philosophy of science that, that somehow got you a job at Chapman? 
So actually, I'm going to say two things here. One is, although it's incredibly fragile in nature, um, what we're trying to do is create it in a controlled way in, in the laboratory. Right? So if you um, take a quantum mechanical system and, and uh, reduce its temperature close to absolute zero, you can get a fine degree of control of these degrees of freedom, and you can actually start to make uh, systems in these entangled states in a variety of different ways. And one of the reasons we're interested is it turns out that's a useful thing to do um, from the point of view of the subject that's known as quantum communication or quantum computing. So uh, in the realm of cryptography, for instance, we can use these entangled states to generate secure communication between uh, two parties, which is in a way that's much more secure than anything that's used uh, presently. So that's one of the applications. Uh, another thing to say, which is what Andrew was probably prompting me for, is that um, there are a lot of entangled states that exist in nature. So it depends on how uh, the system interacts with the, with the outside, right? Um, so for example, inside an atom, just the fact that the atom doesn't collapse into a heap of radiation, the fact that we don't all cease to exist and the, and the entire Chapman crafted uh, go up in a puff of smoke is uh, partly due to entanglement. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Pauli exclusion principle, uh, which says that um, you can't have two electrons that are in the same state. And this is responsible for the fact that you know, matter doesn't just collapse. And in order for that to work, uh, say two electrons which are in uh, a helium atom, for instance, it turns out that they have to be in, a, in, a, in an entangled state. So they exist inside the atom, and they're responsible for us not ceasing to exist. But uh, the problem from the point of view of practical applications is that uh, those things are very hard to access individually. Right? So if we want to create entanglement that's useful for information processing, then we have to work very, very hard. But there are many systems in the universe that are just entangled. Another example, as I mentioned earlier, is that empty space is a highly entangled state according to our, our, um, our most uh, accurate theory of physics. Right? So you may have heard, if you've read any popular science, that the vacuum isn't just empty. There's all kinds of particles popping into and out of existence. But what's really responsible for that is that any two regions of space in empty space aren't aren't in a just uh, uncorrelated state, they're in a very highly entangled state. So we need to understand the mathematics of this just to understand um, how our universe even exists. So we're gonna try right now to make this all crystal clear for everyone. Aaron, raise your hand. Aaron back there on the other side of the room um, has written some computer code. Okay, and he's actually developed an app that we think demonstrates very nicely this concept of entanglement. Um, and so we'd love for you to all play a game. Would you like to play a game? <laughs> ah, that got a little, so people recognize that a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> so um, this is a game based on Bell's theorem, and I'm not sure if can, people can read that, but, but uh, um, there's a, uh, a notion, there we go, awesome. So I'll read this. So in each round of the game, you have two players, so we're gonna pair up, you guys are all gonna pair up. Um, and so you'll basically on your smartphones be doing a coin toss game. Um, the, there will be, I don't know if you wanna explain this a little bit more. Yeah, so, so basically it's a game and, you, and uh, you'll pair up and you can play multiple rounds. You can play as, as many rounds as you like, but e if each pair in the room plays, say, 10 rounds of the game, we're gonna get uh, great statistics. So in each round of the game, you're gonna be shown the outcome of a co coin toss. Right? So both players will get their own individual coin toss. Uh, it'll show either heads or tails. As a response to heads or tails, you have to select a color, so either, which will either be red or blue, okay? Now, you're trying to generate a particular pattern of answers. And the table on there shows you what you're trying to do. So uh, there are, there are, there's two toy toy coin tosses in each round. Player one gets, sees a coin, and player two see, sees a coin. 
If you both see heads, you want to respond the same color, either both red or both blue. If it's heads, tails, or tails, heads, the same thing. But there's only one exception. If you both see tails, you want to respond uh, different colors. So your objective is going to be to try and win this game. Everybody in the room is going to try and win this game at least 80% of the time. If you manage to do that, I will buy everybody in the room a drink. OK. Aaron, can you switch to the next slide? OK, so this, this is how it's going to work. Um, there's a web site that you have to go to. Um, iOS users must not admit the HTTPS bit in front. Um, before you, so you're going to pair up, get into a pairs, and before starting the game, you're allowed to discuss your strategy for playing this game as much as you want. But you're not allowed to communicate with each other during the game. So when you're actually playing, I want the pairs to split up. So all player ones, for example, could stay in this room, and player twos can go in that room. And you're not allowed to talk to each other during the game or do special hand signals or anything like that. Um, and then the way we're going to do this is player one goes first. So player one is going to start a game, enter their responses, do about 10 of them. After player one's finished, player two can select join game in the app, which you'll see there. And you can choose uh, the game that was started by your partner. And then you'll enter your responses. OK? Uh, the way this works at the moment with this app is a bit of a prototype. So I hope everything's going to work all, all right. But you, you have to sign up. So when you first go to the app, you have to go to register, put in your email address, username, password, etc., And then the other player will join the game by clicking on uh, your username, which they'll see uh, when they select join game. OK, so uh, we're going to try and play this over the next 10 minutes or so. So you have three jobs right now. <laughs> Pair up and play the game. That's one job, as per the instructions. Instructions. The second game is if you need another beer, get another beer. And the third job is write down cool questions on the note cards. OK? You've got 10 minutes. Go. What's the proportion of cases you should be able to win this game? Anybody who hasn't studied quantum physics with me, <laughs> preferably, or hasn't studied quantum physics with anybody else, is there anyone who's figured it out? Should I take that as a no? Peter. 75%. And how do you win 75% of the time? OK, so it turns out that's an optimal strategy, because if we look at the conditions, there are three cases where you have to give the same answer, and only one case where you have to give a different answer. So if you always answer the same, both of you, you'll win three times out of four. So I'm expecting about 75% here, which means that you all did extremely terribly at this game. Um, <clears throat> So it turns out you can't do better than, than a 75% regardless of what strategy you choose. You could do absolutely anything you like, uh, and you wouldn't do better than 75%, because basically the four conditions that we have are contradictory. However you choose what outcome you're going to give for each of the coin flips, you'll get three of those conditions right at most, and uh, one of them you'll have to be wrong on every round. Um, now, the surprising thing is, that in quantum mechanics, if you shared an entangled state, so if you, uh, instead of just playing this game classically, if you and your partner created two systems in an entangled state, and if one of you took the particle away with you into the other room when you were playing, then you would be able to win this game about 85% of the time. And this is how we know that uh, entanglement cannot be explained just by this kind of mechanism where it's pre-existing either blue, ball, blue or red balls in the box. Right? We know that there's something else going on. Because the only way that you could, using the kind of game playing that we've done here, the only way you could do better than 75% is if you were allowed to talk to your uh, partner during the game. So this is something surprising that quantum particles can do that, um, that we can't do with ordinary classical physics. <clears throat> so um, what the professor is trying to tell you is you all failed. <laughs> uh, hopefully that doesn't 
hurt your egos too much. Um, we have a, a stack of outstanding questions here. When I read your question, please raise your hand high, be proud. Okay, you will be the recipient of a drink ticket. A little note about drink tickets. The drink tickets are only good during Science on Tap. You don't have to drink tonight. You can gift these to others. You can use them tonight. You can use them at any subsequent Science on Tap, but they're only good during Science on Tap. So the bartenders will look at you really, really confused if you show up like on a Thursday night randomly and ask for a free beer because Chapman said so. It's not gonna work, okay? <laughs> So the first question is, does your comment about 80% wins in the bell game pertain to the law of large numbers? Who asked the question? There we go. A drink for this young man. <laughs> so that's very perceptive of you. Uh, you must be uh, an expert in statistics. You see, I could have said, if you win more than 75% of the time, but I deliberately chose 80% because you could, by a statistical fluctuation, just uh, happen to have got coin flips where you could answer, um, you could even get a set of coin flips where you could answer 100% of the time if it just happened that, that tails, tails never came up. So I made it a bit above 75% to make sure that the probability that you would win the game and that I'd have to buy everyone a drink was extremely low. I haven't actually count calculated it, but I'm pretty sure it would, on average, take longer than the age of the universe for you to win the game. So the odds were really stacked against you. <laughs> the next question is, I heard that IBM has a quote-unquote quantum computer that is available somehow for the general public. Is there a way of verifying that their quantum computer is really quantum? Whose question is this? Ah, Chris, a drink for that young man who is also younger than me. I knew that was a sophisticated question because it's coming from my postdoc. So, um, <clears throat> so there is a, a, a field of, uh, of quantum computation theory now which is called uh, device independence. And um, device independence is about how do you verify that something's quantum without having access to, without having access to how it works, right? So I can't go to IBM, open the, open the box of their quantum computer and check what's happening inside. All I can do is send queries to the cloud, they get processed and I get the data back. So how can we tell that something like that is, uh, is, is quantum mechanical? Um, so testing the, the Bell's theorem, what's what we've just done, showing that you get 85% uh, or more than 75% on a test like that is one of the ways that's used in the laboratory to check that there's really some quantum entanglement going on. There are similar things that you could do with a computer that's, that's in the cloud. Uh, the problem is that in order to test entanglement like this, you have to make sure that the, the two systems are very, very far apart so that there's no possibility of them communicating at light speed between each other during the experiments. But there are other kinds of assumptions that you can make um, which would allow you to test uh, device independently a quantum computer. And uh, this is currently a topic of, ab uh, of active research. So I'm not going to say exactly how you would do it because I'm not 100% sure. But uh, there are things that you can do along those lines. So Matt's kids just showed up. And, and I'll tell you something, Matt. As the father of two teenagers, I think this is about the last time they'll be able to sit in the audience and say what dad does is cool. <laughs> right? It all goes downhill from here, trust me. Um, so here's a question from uh, uh, an educator that says, do you have some great websites on quantum mechanics that I can share with my high school students? Probably something that's difficult to, to do verbally, but um, I'm sure we can, we, can, we can post those, but do you have some thoughts on that? Um, <coughs> actually, I have a list of links for things on my website. So if you go to mattleifer.info, uh, there's some resources on the foundations of quantum mechanics you can find there. 
Uh, much of it's uh, aimed at university level, uh, but there are some things out there that you could use, um, use at high school level. In particular, uh, the Institute of Physics in the UK has a collection of resources aimed at, um, excuse me, it's an, it's an online um, sort of tutorial system, which is very good. There's another thing which I really like. Uh, in, in the past few years, there's been quite an upsurge in what's what I call quantum games. So this is like apps you can download for your phone, uh, which will illustrate the principles of quantum mechanics. Uh, there are many of them. Uh, my favorite at the moment is something called Quantum Game with Photons. And it presents uh, sort of basic quantum experiments uh, in, a, in the form of a puzzle game. You have to make the photons hit the detectors in the right proportions. Uh, and I would uh, actually think that's a very good introduction to uh, how the mathematics of quantum mechanics works. I'm sorry, whose question was that? Right here. Sorry. Fantastic. Your students just won. Right. You can also, of course, use belgay.me in class uh, if you wish to, uh, but you may wish to contact Aaron before doing so because uh, we're, it's the prototype stage. So this is actually a question that, this is the kind of question that I would have asked because I'm a physical chemist, which means that I'm far too bound by what I perceive as reality. Um, and so the question is, by what medium would the information of the boo ball in the box be transferred to Mars? What medium is faster than light? Or I think, you know, what medium could transmit information faster than light? So, so... What question is that now? Right here, right in front. So this has a long answer and a short answer. Short answer first, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is the reason why this is a fascinating topic. And the reason why it's very controversial in the foundations of quantum mechanics, it's the, it's the reason why it's like the canonical number one thought experiment that people talk about. So basically, we don't know what's going on. And uh, what we do know is a lot about what isn't going on, right? Uh, so there are various different interpretations of quantum mechanics. And what they say happens uh, depends on interpretation. Right, so there are many physicists, probably the vast majority of physicists, excuse me, who believe that there is no faster than light um, influence. In order to support that, you have to give up on sort of very basic notions of what we consider reality to be like. So the idea that there's an independent reality that's independent of us, our observations, you have to give up that in that kind of line. But there are other interpretations which say, um, that there is actually a faster than light influence, for instance. There's, uh, for example, there's a theory called Bohmian mechanics, which posits something called a quantum potential, which uh, is the sort of the thing that's responsible for mediating the correlation. It acts faster than light in order to avoid violating, uh, well, it really violates relativity. You kind of have to say Einstein's relativity is wrong and it's sort of only apparently true because we don't know the full details of what's going on in reality. There's things like the many worlds theory, which also allow there to be no faster than light influence by postulating that actually it's not just a single outcome that, may, that happens when you make a measurement, but multiple outcomes, all the outcomes happen at the same time. And this is highly controversial. Like, like if you want my own opinion, I really think there isn't anything faster than light going on. Uh, which means that we're probably making some assumption in our treatment of this that's just, uh, it's so it's such an obvious assumption that we probably don't realize that we're making it. Uh, I'm drawing an analogy here with relativity. If you know Einstein derived relativity from two postulates, which is that physics looks the same to everybody and that everybody sees the speed of light as the same. Those seem like a contradiction when you first uh, hear them, because if somebody is running along at a high velocity, they should see, if, if I fire a beam of light, you'd expect them to see the light moving slower. But uh, what Einstein realized was that there's an, an underlying assumption there, which is that the structure of space and time is just what we thought it was in Newtonian mechanics. And what he showed was that 
the postulates actually imply that it's not that like that. Space and time have a different structure. So what I think is really going on is there's some assumption that we're making about physics that we don't know what it is yet, and when we realize what it is and we change it, everything will fall into place. But that's kind of a faith, because I like Einstein and I like relativity and I'd like to preserve it, but we really don't know, and it's a, it's a subject of great controversy and debate still today. <clears throat> There's your dinner table conversation for the evening. Um, so this question is uh, about how quantum mechanics applies more generally. So how does quantum mechanics apply to the general public, and what do you believe is an extremely important part of it that they may not know? Who asked this question? In the back of the room over there, one of our lovely Chapman students. So I definitely picked this question because it's a challenging one for me. I'm, I'm definitely a theorist, and I'm usually of the opinion that you know, we study these things because they're cool, right? I mean, who, who doesn't want to hear about things that go faster than the speed of light, right? Um, but, uh, I mean, so there's two answers to this question. One is that, uh, you know, a lot of modern technology, including cell phones, uh, computers, and things like that, rely on quantum mechanics for their operation. So we uh, have to use the theory of quantum mechanics to figure out how transistors work, for instance, and that has enabled pretty much all of modern technology. So it's very important for that reason. Uh, but there's kind of two levels to this question, which is that I said at the beginning that I'm interested in the weird parts of quantum mechanics. Right? So there's a whole host of, quant of applications of quantum mechanics where you don't have to think too carefully about the weird parts. You just sort of go ahead and apply the theory. And most of the applications that we're talking about uh, to modern technology are of that form. You can then ask what kinds of things are there that really exploit the weird aspects of quantum mechanics like entanglement, and that's where the whole uh, relatively new field that only really started in the 80s and 90s of quantum information and quantum computing comes in, and that's uh, you know what we're really driving for now, trying to build quantum computers and things like that. As far as what the general public cares about, uh, the most, the sort of headline of that is security, right? So if we could build a quantum computer, then uh, we could break a lot of the crypto systems that are used to secure the internet right now, so to secure your credit card transactions when you go to Amazon, for instance. But at the same time, there's a promise to have uh, really secure um, cryptography, so the ability to send communications secretly based just on the laws of quantum physics, which uh, would be far more secure than... Um, than current technologies. So some of these applications use entanglement in a very uh, interesting way, uh, but it's, again, a subject of active research. Uh, more and more applications are, are being developed, and the progress towards um, using these quantum technologies is starting to become really rapid. The US government, for instance, uh, the House of Representatives just passed a bill, uh, which is amazing, in these uh, polarized times that, we, that both Democrats and Republicans agreed on it to create a, a massive fund for uh, quantum technologies um, in order to keep the United States as a leader in this field. Other countries are also heavily investing, in particular China, which is one of the reasons why, uh, why this bill was passed so, so quickly. So there's a lot of interest in these technologies. A lot of money is going into it right now. Uh, and it's also a big area for startup and venture capital funding at the moment. So we have time for one final question. If this is yours, consider yourself very lucky. If quantum entanglement implies two particles having a relationship, what does this mean if all matter was, at one point, part of a singularity at the beginning of the universe's inception? There we go. He was on pins and needles, right? So, um, it, if so, so there, there are a couple of responses to this, right? So, one thing, one thing you could say in light of the entanglement and possibly faster than light influences, 
is to say, well, so what? At the beginning of time, there was only one point of space and time. Everything was together, right? So we could imagine that at the Big Bang, uh, all of these correlations were set up at the beginning. And, um, and then, you know, the universe just expanded, and now we're just seeing that. And this explanation is uh, a possible explanation. It's, it goes under the name of superdeterminism. And uh, there are very few people who advocate it, but one of the people who advocates it is a Nobel laureate, uh, Gerald Tuft. Um, so at least one very smart person advocates it. The reason why most physicists don't accept this explanation is it seems to involve some kind of global conspiracy, right? So there would have to be some correlation between the choices that we make for the measurement settings, whether we flip heads or tails in the game, and uh, the, the quantum particles that we're measuring. Now, you could choose your measurement settings based on anything you like. You could choose, uh, you know, the wet, what's the weather in Singapore right now, right? You could use that to choose your, your measurements. You could use um, free will in inverted commas. You could have humans choosing the settings. Or in a recent experiment, you could even have uh, two quasars on opposite sides of the galaxy. You could take photons from those quasars and use measurements on them to choose your settings. And there's, there's no real physical mechanism or reason why we should expect those to be correlated. They'd have to be highly correlated with the system we're investigating. And we don't have a physical reason or mechanism why that's the case. It's possible. Some people investigate it. It is a way of saving the locality. Another thing to say is that, you know, the singularity at the Big Bang, uh, well, we know, as I said earlier in quantum field theory, that just ordinary space is highly, is highly entangled, right? So these entanglement correlations are sort of ubiquitous and everywhere. But if it sort of happens in a sort of generic and random way, you would expect any two systems, if you, if you randomly pick two particles in the universe, not to be able to see any correlation or entanglement between them. So it's, um, you know, you would require sort of a very conspiratorial setup to make two specific par particles that, uh, that we create in the lab sort of entangled right from back in the Big Bang. So it's, it's a possible explanation, but it's not one that most people advocate. So that little commentary on quantum fake news um, brings us to the end of our hour. I want to thank you all for joining us for the first Science on Tap of the season. <laughs> Thanks again to Chapman Crafted, our new home. Big round of applause. Thank you to all of our student and parent volunteers. Thank you also again to um, Panther Productions for making us look and sound as awesome as possible. Thank you to Matt for joining us and telling us a little bit about quantum physics. We were, bit, we were fed by the Mex It Up truck. And last but certainly not least, thank you, Sarah Buckley, for putting this whole thing together. You are truly awesome. I'll say that uh, this was Sarah's first Science on Tap. And um, I got to say, it's pretty awesome. Fantastic job, Sarah. Thank you. Our next Science on Tap is Monday, the 15th of October at 6 p.m. Professor Georgiana Bostein will be here telling us about how space and place affect your health. So Georgiana is a sociologist um, who also uses a variety of different mapping techniques to understand how where we live changes how healthy we are. A very, very different topic. Very interesting area of research. One thing I'll say about the schedule for this year's Science on Tap, both for fall and spring semester, 
is unlike previous years where we've had a combination of internal and external speakers, this year we are all looking internal to Schmidt speakers in celebration of our new home, the Keck Center for Science and Engineering. So this is really a celebration of us all being together under more or less one roof, which has not been the case for the entirety of the existence of Schmidt College. So in celebration of the new building, the Keck Center for Science and Engineering, we're doing an entire year of Science on Tap that's all Schmidt faculty. I hope you enjoy that. Here's a future Schmidt faculty member in front of us, um, but hopefully not physics, yeah? Because uh, that would be a little bit too incestuous, right? We need to, maybe biology or chemistry would be better. Anyway, we'll see you in October. Thank you.